very excited this morning for many reasons, but among them, uh, we have a very dynamic presentation uh, set up for you today. Um, and it will be by Dr. Intels, who our esteemed research fellow. Uh, and as the chair, we have uh, Mr. Francis Amwani. Um, Dr. Ntilusui asked me how long would my introduction of the chair be. At that time, I realized that I was supposed to give long introductions every week when I come up here. So, uh, Mr. Francis Kennedy Amwani is a pharmacist in Ghana who holds a, a Master of Science in Pharmaceutical Quality by Design from the De Montfort University in the United Kingdom. Uh, since 2004, he has worked as a pharmacist at the Kolebu Teaching Hospital, and as of February 2005, he has worked as a regulatory officer at the Food and Drugs Authority, Ghana. Uh, he has represented the Food and Drugs Authority and the World Health Organization on a number of teams for the inspection and investigations into medicines in the USA, India, and China. These representations that the inspections and investigations were to ensure the control and manufacture of good quality, safe, and efficacious medicines, be it orthodox or traditional or herbal, uh, that are imported into the country of Ghana. So he is definitely someone who uh, we expect to give uh, a lot of insight into Dr. Ntewusu's research. Uh, a lot of people asked me about this uh, presentation um, because they said it looked like an advertisement. They thought they would get free datura, uh, free labor, free sex, or <laughs> free madness, as we learned last week that we can buy and sell illnesses. So with no further ado, I will turn it over to our esteemed chair, uh, Mr. Amwadi, and from there we'll go to Dr. Ntewusu. All right, thank you for coming. As is mentioned already, my name is Francis Kennedy Amani. Before I introduce uh, our speaker, I would just like to um, I took a look at his presentation and uh, I knew he had too much of a social dimension to it. So I will just add a little signs on what we will call clinical aspect of it. The datura in question when it's ingested into your system, there are two main things it will do to you. It will block uh, some neural functions. That is, the way you talk, the way you walk, and even some things that you do unconsciously, such as when you eat and the food is being digested, you don't control it. When you breathe, your lungs movement, you don't control it. Uh, your blood vessels dilating or expanding, you don't control it. This particular substance goes to affect some of all these areas. So this is just a clue when he begins to talk and elaborate on the social impact. Also pick it from this clinical point of view and then imagine what happens thereafter. It's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Ntosu, as has been said. We all already know that Dr. Ntosu is a social scientist uh, and a historian, of course, with varied interests. What do I mean? He's written so many publications and even books, some are yet to come out, one of which is Settling In and Holding On, which is still under reprint or uh, a third reprint in the Netherlands. Um, his publications also include the social history of roads in Ghana. Others also include his work on um, the biographies of people we know, such as Dr. Mohamed bin Chambers and Ike Bedema, which are in the Oxford Dictionary. And he continues to write on other topics such as the methodologies on the archives of Ghana. And I don't want to talk too much about the things he's done or who he is. You already know. But sometimes before you become who you are, you also enjoy some form of mentorship from others. 
Some people, such as Professor Joa Jambat from Leiden University, he's mentored him. Others, such as Professor Atukwesin, formerly of Cambridge University. Our own Professor Irene Odote, and so many other people. And he's written so many other books or papers, such as the monographs on colonialism, food history, to mention by a few. There are so many of them, but let's cut them short. Samuel Nteusu, uh, doctor, but we popularly call him Grundo. That's his local name, anyway. He is a local boy. He grew up in the village. Typical village called Balai in the northern region. And when he was growing up, I came to find out, even though he didn't know, that he used to isolate himself from his peers. And he was always alone. And in the village, when you are alone, where do you go to? You climb mango trees to eat mangoes. Where would you walk to? The nearest place you go to is the bush. Where do you find? You find shrubs, you find plants. He comes from the hunter's family. And in the village, when elderly people find you isolated, they try to bring you closer to them and teach you other skills that you cannot learn from your peers. So one of uh, our grandfathers, actually his step-grandfather, Nana Pupi, was a herbalist and used to carry Dr. Ntosu along into the bush. So you can understand his interest in plants and shrubs and eating mangoes. I'm a pharmacist and I've studied uh, a subject called pharmacology, that is uh, plants. And I can attest to the fact that Dr. Ntosu can give you a plant to treat your stomach pains and then you will be relieved in five minutes. If the plant is around, yes, he can do that. This issue of plants, five years ago I was in the office and then he came. And he was very excited. You know why he finds, I don't know how many of you really know him, but when he finds something interesting, he's always so excited, he tries to draw you in. He brought this thing and showed it to me and said, do you know it? I took a look at it. As a pharmacist, I couldn't make up even what it was. Then he said, it's called Bukuma. Well, I, I knew the traditional name. I know what it does, but I didn't even know any science about it. So I said, okay, what do you want us to do? He said, I want us to test it. I said, I'll find what, I'll find what it contains. I said, why? Then he gave me a whole lecture. <laughs> it will pass for a new book. So I had no choice but to also be drawn into a historian or a social historian's uh, interest in science. So yes, we took it. And then we did some analysis to find out exactly what it was. And it was as he thought. So uh, a few months ago, I was still in the UK. And then he called me and said, I'd like you to chair a seminar. I said, on what? He said, oh, on Bukuma, as we discussed the last time. So I, as a pharmacist, also has no choice but to be drawn into these social dimensions that come into medicine. If I give a medication to a patient and the patient takes it or not or abuses it, I do not know. That is a social dimension of my practice, which I have no idea what happens after I give a medication to somebody. So if another person is coming to tell me exactly what the people do with those medicines, I'll be very excited to know. So that as part of my counseling uh, process, I will include it and let them know taking the medicine is implications, not taking it is implications, and this abuse or misuse is implications. So please join me to welcome Dr. Tosu.
to give us a presentation on the social history of Datura, its use in Ghana. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kennedy, for the long introduction and foraging into some of my private affairs. <laughs> it is indeed true that the other part of my life is usually not known. That is the fact that I sometimes would like to just walk about in the wilderness and, and just think about myself or about others. And as indicated, the interest in the social history of this plant came about as a result of my association with the plant whilst in the village and later whilst in school. But first and foremost, we need to understand what social history is. I am not trying to convert everybody to be a social historian. But social history, history basically is just concerned about little things that we don't sometimes take seriously, but yet in a manner influences a lot of social and historical events. So it is quite a bit different from Balkan history where you are concerned about kings, you are concerned about uh, heads of states and the rest. This one we are concerned about mad people, we are concerned about laborers, we are concerned about Everything. But these are important in shaping bigger issues. Now, datura is a very common weed that grows along roads and uh, around settlements. The origin of the plant is still a bit debatable. Some indicate that it actually originated from India. Others are also of the view that it originated from Mexico. Nonetheless, Datura is widespread and in almost every continent that you go, you come across Datura. Now, there are about 12 to 15 species of Datura, but the most common among them seems to be Datura stramonium. Now, the success of the growth of this uh, plant is its ability to evolve over time through natural mutation and human assistance. Many ordinary names have been associated or given to the tuna. Some of them include Jimson weed, local weed, angel's trumpet, devil's trumpet or devil's apple, tongue apple, mad apple, stink weed, sacred weed, green dragon. But the most widely used is Jimson weed. And we need to go into the history as to why the name Jimson weed seemed to be popular. This common name was said to be a contracted form of Jamestown weed. And it was after it was used in 1676 in Jamestown, Virginia. And then the name came about because there was record of United States, or, or there were records of soldiers who were sent to quiet rebellion who decided to take some of the seats. And therefore, the name Jamestown Weed came, or Jameson Weed. Locally, we also have names for uh, the children. The gang called it Oula Kofiba. Or Bekebi, I think, I don't know the meaning of Bekebi, but I fortunately have a lot of well-established Ghana people here who will help me out. And then in three, it is called Mofrabinian, or Pepe Adiyewu, or Atiyabodam. <laughs> it's also called Kwasiyadiyewu, or Adiyewu. Now, uh, in Ebe, it is called Jokbe, Jokbe Bo. And in Konkomba, it is, or Lepapa, it is called Lopaja Tafa, which means the male dog's ear. In Dabane, it is called Bunkuma Borokong. But this Bunkuma Borokong is, is just a description of the symptoms that you get as a result of taking it, which is a dryness of your throat. 
So I am here to find out the real meaning of it. But nonetheless, once you mention Bunkuma Borokong, everybody uh, in Dagbam will know what you are talking about. In Ghana, it grows about almost everywhere, but it is particularly concentrated in Teshi land. That is with respect to Accra and Afenia. We also have Chromantin in the uh, central region, Tutu and Mampon in Apepin here, Eburi, uh, Weja, sorry, in Accra also, uh, Aveno, and then Pafro, also near Cape Coast. There are several descriptions of how it grows, and I think for now there's no need to go into that detail. There is no evidence of that tura being planted by anybody in Ghana, but nonetheless, people harvest it for various uh, uses. The tura belongs to the family Solenaceae, the nightshades, which include some 2,400 species in total. Well known plants in the family include vegetables such as tomatoes, garden eggs, or eggplant. And then we have to potatoes and some narcotics such as mandrake and tobacco. So what I simply want to imply here is that in one way or the other, we are associated with Datura via its other family members. As an alkaloid pregnant plant, it shares a number of similarities with common substances such as coffee, marijuana, and alcohol. Datura has a number of uses, and indeed has been used in various ways by societies over the years, thus making it an important plant to study. While a lot of researchers have, uh, researchers have studied Datura from a scientific and methodological perspective, uh, medical perspective, historians have often been left out in the study of Datura. I must, however, state that there have been interesting historical works on drugs that served as important guides to this study. For example, I rely heavily on the publications of Immanuel Achampong on alcohol and cannabis. I also gain a lot of insights from Afene, who worked on marijuana, heroin, and cocaine abuse in Ghana, and especially in Accra Studio, the hub of the drug business in Ghana. In Nigeria, worked by T. A. Lambo and Alexander Brofka, Brof Brof among ex servicemen also offered very useful insights. But again, in Ghana, historians have been slow to explore the, to explore the significance of least known drugs such as Datura and its impact on society. This study is in part as a result of this failure. But the research uh, disassociates itself from the hardcore scientific analysis of Datura but instead concentrates on the use of Datura for labor, religious or divination, and sexual purposes. Now, methodology. I have employed a number of methods in my attempt to understand the social history of Datura. Datura. I have carried the seats as our chair indicated to the Food and Drugs Board and forced him to give me an analysis. Still not satisfied, I carried the plant to the botany department and met Professor Dante and asked Professor Dante to help me with the analysis, which he gladly did. I also spoke to a number of people, including uh, my mentor, or uh, former mayor of Accra, Nat Nuno Amatefi, who continues to follow my academic uh, progress. Prof. Arian has been noted, but she wasn't there then. A cover site was also conducted to understand the nature of this very datura. And I've spoken to a number of traders, uh, drivers, uh, herbalists, and uh, what have you. I must, however, indicate that there's so much limitation as far as the Akaba sources are concerned. And this should not be surprising to any historian because the archives are largely a generation of administrators. And therefore, the concern in the archives is usually about issues of administration and not issues that are related to hardcore sciences. 
However, I chance too fast, that spoke to the subject. And as I continue with the presentation, I will uh, come out with those files and then what they say of uh, uh, the children. But as indicated earlier, the limitations actually were well contained through interviews and then some of the publications that uh, I have mentioned already. Now we go straight into the African world of drugs and then the children. A champion indicates that the historical record on the use of mood altering substances in Africa dates to the pre colonial period. Drugs have had a long historical role in Sub Saharan Africa, in Sub -Saharan Africa as ritual artifacts, economic goods, and social markets. For example, cannabis or marijuana appears to have grown wild in Ethiopia and southern Africa for centuries. It was incorporated into ritual, aiding, into ritual, aiding monastic contemplation in Ethiopia and healing therapy in Zimbabwe. Chat, or cat, has been used in Ethiopia, Somalia, uh, Somalia and Kenya for centuries, just as has a, a boga plant, witty uh, healing calls in Cameroon and Gabon. The use of foreign hard drugs such as cocaine and heroin has been on the increase since the mid-1980s due to the spillover effect from the utilization of West, East and Southern Africa as transit points in the smuggling of heroin and cocaine to the European and North American markets. Cocaine has come through West Africa from South America and Harry Bernstein describes the trafficking in marijuana, cocaine and heroin as among the most dynamic and valuable of Africa's non-traditional exports and rate exports. One quote, <laughs> okay. One could therefore include, uh, conclude that after all, Africa is not new to the use of drugs and other mood altering substances. Today, our attention is drawn to an important and non-criminalized drug, the Tura, and its consumption for labor, medical, religious, divinatory, sex and sexual purposes. On the issue of the children and labor, I draw insights from literature on zombies and zombification in Haiti. And here I would like to credit uh, Mr. Nuno Amatafiu for pointing me to the literature uh, regarding this issue in Haiti. Zombies occupy an enviable position in Haitian folklore and history. The stark reality of the conditions under which zombies are created comes from the process and combination of a number of factors which include magic and an accumulation of empirical data collected by ancestors about psychology, physiology, and toxicology. The cultures of zombie ritualism owes its haunting reality to poison, anxiety, and physical trauma. In his encounter with voodoo society, Michel Belinsky narrates horrifying stories in his book Into the Zombie Underworld. A few extracts from this book will help bring the point on the children and labor home. He writes, and I quote, The Haitian zombie is the product of a series of terrifying, terrifying experiences, all specific to the cultural context of Haiti. First comes the overwhelming trauma of having been buried alive, which leads to total lucidity through the entire order. Upon removal from the coffin, the would-be zombie is fed a hallucinogenic drug from the plant datura, locally known by the suggested, locally known by the suggested name Combre zombie. At the same time, the victim is given a ferocious, a ferocious beating by his captors. The final touch is the total rejection of the zombie by his own community. The victim, once abandoned, is now a zombie. The zombie is like a living corpse working on the plantation of his owner. I must add that further literature on zombie in Haiti indicates that it takes only divine forces or another powerful individual to be able to free one from the zombification or condition that somebody has helped that person. What is of relevance, however, is the extent to which the zombie can be identified by the community members. But he, the zombie, forgets entirely about his or her own existence. Despite these broad generalizations about their condition, there were isolated cases where zombies have come back to their normal selves and have moved into their communities to narrate their own experience 
or in some cases will not even arrange what happened. Back in Ghana, the utilization of substances by individuals to zombify others in order to facilitate labor is not new. An informal discussion with some of my senior colleagues, such as Dr. Larson, Edward Nambigini, and the director of the Polytechnic, show how farm owners in Ghana would drug their neighbors with industrial drugs, such as Anna Olaan, Diagram Kwara, and the rest. And our pharmacist is there to come with uh, cynical names for us to be able to understand. Uh, others include people and astigmatists which will enable laborers to perform bad excellence on their farms. Finish work on or before time is very important. It is a cost saving strategy. The more laborers kept on one's farm, the more one spends on feeding and accommodation. In addition, one needs to go with their land to survive them. In calculating the total cost, it was cheaper to acquire a drug that would not cost the farmer persons and get the job done. Switch, switch, switch from industrial rights and process drugs. Interviews and archival said also revealed that the children have been used for the same purpose for enhancing the performance. As recent as a year ago, I came across a scene which I thought was right, but which children investigations indicate for a very usual. One weekend, I was very new to jury time and chose to sit with a group of young men at the popular school in the village called EBC. I saw a group of senior high school students from the school located one mile away from where we were seated, moving about. Further questions revealed that they were looking for farm work, popularly called Maggie. One of the teachers, who now is a graduate student in this city, offered me answers. He said in a quote, Some of them will finish the farm on Saturday or at West on Sunday, but with the assistance of that. Here we realize the possibility of self-inflicted zombie, one that is not the making of an external being, as we encountered in Haiti, but that of the very individual engaged in labor. In reporting of our northern island areas in the mines during the earlier period, then Secretary for Mines, F. Kogel, reported in 1909 that the mines in Ashanti had always relied on labor from present day northern territories and for uh, 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 food, daughter and Liberia. Of importance was their hard work and their loyalty to their supervisors. The report further indicates that in some cases, some of the laborers choose cease to stay awake and to work. Here, one could not tell what the seas were, as a paper in progress, oral interviews would be needed to establish the missing link. But with the linguistic evidence from the field provide aspects with answers to this. For example, site, site names that are mentioned as Pepe, Diawu, Atia Wadam, be enough to draw conclusions that indeed the, chief, the things that were being achieved in the mines were actually the children. Back in Northern Ghana, the evidence of its use in mining is not hard to find. No. Oh, well, this was the methodology. Yes, it's not hard to find. In 1935, two gold prospectors, Buck, Mark Guinness, an Australian, and Doug Green, an English, who had considerable experience in industrial mining in southern Ghana, moved up north to mine. Their efforts were driven by the immediate increase in the price of gold after the Great Depression. They negotiated for land with Nana Azuri II, the chief of the Nava. Following their establishment in 1935 of a small industrial gold mine, initially powered by a millet fed generator by the 1940s, the Nangodi gold mine was utilizing a cyanide lithium system for extracting gold, as was, as was done in the south. But one important legacy that the two miners left was the taking of new pictures and the introduction of Datura to their workers. It must, however, be emphasized that it was not Guinness and Reed who introduced Datura into the Nagodi area prior to the use of Datura for mining. For mining, The plant was already used for divination, informing its local name, Chikriku Kuma, the ferris plant, a point which I'll discuss in further detail in the course of this presentation. 
But besides money, Datura also was used by warriors. If we consider war as an industry and warriors and combatants as laborers, we see the utility in the use of drugs and other mood or altering substances in war. Two informants in Tamale and one in Accra indicate that Datura was an important war logistic. At first, it was fed to horses that were sent to war to enable them to perform. With, to perform. With time, some of the warriors themselves started taking it. In our interaction with security experts on the relevance of my findings regarding the Tura and warfare, he added that such similar ingestions of hallucinogenic drugs in Sierra Leone and Liberia occurred at the time of their wars. He asked that for the warrior, the purpose of making oneself invisible to the enemy is not only about black magic, but also could be analyzed from a physiological point of view, a, a psychological point of view, where the one who has ingested the drug feels invisible, therefore becomes much more courageous, even in the midst of eminent death. There is an extent to which the issue of Datura and Kore even becomes much more relevant if one begins to analyze student demonstrations in Ghana about three decades ago. In the 1980s, the structural adjustment program had affected a lot of sectors, especially the educational and agricultural sectors. At the educational level, grants to schools were cut and food supplies to schools were erratic. There were even instances where in some schools in the north, businessmen and merchants had to supply food in order to avoid the closure of schools. In terms of food, headmasters and matrons had to substitute quality for quantity. To add to the problem, broken beds were hardly repaired, leading to the popular term checking the floor, which was a situation where students were forced to sleep on the floor. Students' agitation for improvement and reforms were met with silence or with excuses. The solution lied in radical measures. Aluta became the preferred and only choice for students. As if a demonstration timetable was drawn, demonstrations started from one school to another and soon spread to other schools. Incidentally, this period also coincided in the increase of abuse of pork, marijuana, and natura, some out of frustration and others for the sake of the demonstrations. Indeed, as a student at, the, as at that time, my study group was accused of masterminding the 1989 risings in the school leading to the dismissal of three of my colleagues. Unfortunately, when we were called back, another mate of mine was searched at assembly, and it was discovered on him cigarettes, datura, and mild box. And to make a case for punishment, the mild box was exhibited as a mini explosive. <laughs> it must be indicated that the oral evidence provided for the consumption of datura in schools came out in a research that was conducted later by the Ghana Education Service in 1994. By 1999, the National Union of Ghana Students, the University Students Association, had added its voice to the campaign against drug use among secondary and tertiary uh, students. Nooks noted how many students were enticed into drug use as they believed this would boost their academic performance or social confidence, or social confidence in school. Rather, they ended up being confused instead, instead or mentally unhinged. Moving from East role, uh, East labor relations, Datura also served certain religious functions. My interest in Datura and divination uh, was actually brought up in March 2013 when I traveled with Swedish uh, counterpart Professor Olo Dali to investigate the popularity of the country shrine in the village of Bala. Our arrival coincided with the final funeral rites of a relation of mine. Now, we funerals always end with the relation to find out the cause of death and the wish or wishes of the deceased. Furthermore, funeral divinations will also enable the community to find out whether other souls were about to drain their ancestral well and if their death would be, could be avoided. The diviner came with a stick, some cowries, charcoal, a broken calabash, and leaves from the locals being trained. We were all thrilled by his precision. This made precision of events. This made me to immediately book an interview with the diviner. 
He took time to explain to me the deployment of the Tura in his trade. That quantities were ingested the night before, which in most cases would let him be able to commence to converse with the ancestors and the dead. So what he comes to say in public is just communication between them and in the previous night. But more important is his explanation behind the real name of the plant in Lepapal, which is called Lebo Tafa, the dog's ear. Further questions as to why the dog and not the ear of other things say the ant. That is if you can see the ear of an ant. <laughs> Reveal several layers of meaning between plants and animals on one hand and their similarities with human beings. The dog, he explained, first and foremost, is equated to a human being and forms the greatest sacrifice to most deities of protection. Besides, the dog has several features as human beings smell, hearing, moves. In some cases, even their sense of intuition is far greater than that of man, as they could be see beyond what we don't see. They don't easily trust strangers as we do. Their trust for their master is undivided. That is why they are the best species for security. Moving away from this manifesto in defense of the dog, I shift emphasis to the ear and why the Tura will gain this name and might more become important in divination. It is useful to indicate that the ears the ear is important as far as decoding and messages from the spirit world is concerned. In the world of divination, figuratively speaking, hearing is much more important than seeing, despite the overemphasis by many com commentators on the second eye. The world of divination privileges a particular sensory organ, the ear. The act of listening to the message from the spiritual world, hence the name the waterfall and is used in divination. Divination is a process, and that Tura, due to its hallucinogenic properties, enables the individual to transcend the physical space into the spiritual state, and hence access the needed information from the divine. It is important to indicate that the ability to use the Tura for this purpose is not limited to concumbent alone, but is very much common in other societies as well. Among the aspects uh, of Central Mexico, for example, the Tura enjoys a particularly sacred status. It was regarded as the sister of Oluluque, and fortunately you might help me with better explanations to that. Another sacred hallucinogenic plant. These plants were so sacred that only priests were allowed to use them. With their help, they held counsel with the deities, with the deities, defining the outcome of future events, discovering the whereabouts of lost or stolen objects and prognosticating the causes of diseases, especially if black magic was suspected in the illness. For the location, and also for the location of thieves and stolen animals. Here, it is not the individual's physical body that is in operation, but his sensory organs that have been stimulated or activated via the ingestion or consumption of the tumor. I would like to move to an important aspect of the presentation, which is the issue of sex. Aphrodisiacs have been utilized in most cultures, often fairly extensively. Adam Woodley, in his book entitled Sex, Drugs, and Aphrodisiacs, defines aphrodisiacs as, an, as any substance which can be used to increase sexual energy and desire, promote and help maintain erection, delay premature ejaculation, and intensify performance. In some instances, aphrodisias uh, serve as tonic for the health of the sexual organs and enable sex to be enjoyed. The Asian cultures of Asia, the Americas, Arabs, Chinese, the Greeks, the Romans, and the, Arab, and the Arabs all make use of considerable quantity of sexual stimulants. One of the oldest religious historical documents, the Bible, makes mention of aphrodisiac use. Without offending my active and partial Christians, I quote from Genesis 30, verse 40 to 22, where the issue of Rachel and Leah actually talks about mandrake being brought in. And of course, there was a contest about who should be, uh, feed this mandrake to Jacob. Incidentally, uh, I think uh, Leah won and fed Jacob with that and 
the outcome was uh, another thief or is a thief child. Those who are very well versed in the Bible will be able to tell us more. But to also continue, uh, as indicated uh, in, in, in the introduction, uh, the Torah doesn't only serve this other purpose, but also for sexual reason. And also going back to the Bible, uh, there's the need for us to also appreciate the reason why today most pastors would prescribe every manner of thing for people to take for their spiritual and physical uh, achievement of their needs. So if they say you should go and consume say Gary and Bakushito, you don't need to say no because the person might be taking inspiration from what I have just quoted. As, as previously noted, that Tura has been widely used for sexual purposes globally. Indeed, and uh, uh, the Tura featured prominently in Bakan Lian August, which involves a lot of alcohol, sex, and uncontrolled behavior in honor of Bakul, the God of Wine. The sexual vigor that the Tura engendered in Rome in the 1500s and 1600s did not go unrecognized by English women who use it as a point against their lazy husbands, who could not perform or sustain their sexual desires. They put their blame on one stimulant, coffee. They claim that whereas the Tura stimulates love and sex, coffee did not. In the Women's Petition Against Coffee in 1674, they resented their husband's addiction to the, quote, darkened, nasty, bitter, stinking, nauseous pattern water that allegedly caused impotence, useful only in bringing about political and academic discussions than their marital responsibilities. <laughs> and this was a petition that was given to Prince Charles. In India, the Tura has been used to stupefy virgins and young boys, making them easy prey for seduction and rape. And among the Indians of the Amazon, the Tura drink, locally called Makor, was essential and indeed required in the initiation rites of boys who were entering manhood. Makor was given to them to drink, and those who could not drink all, the remaining were ins inserted into their annals as enemies. Hmm. The drink was supposed to make them sleep or enter into a trance in which they were visited by ancestors who could instruct them on their sexual and other expected behavior as men. The usefulness of the Tura in sex is not limited to Asia or Europe alone. In Africa, there are reports of its use in sex and in initiation. T.F. Johnson, in his article, The Tura is used in Chonga Girls' Initiation in Mozambique, discussed how the Tura was brought and given to girls to drink. The purpose is for them to receive instructions from the ancestral world on how to be good wives and how to offer good sex in marriage. They were also to receive visionary instructions on childbearing. One does not leave the place of initiation until one receives these visions and is able to narrate it to those performing the rites. In Ghana, Datura alone or in combination with other herbs have been widely used in sex. In fact, an alternative explanation to Lobart uh, from the dog's ear, was his ability to activate dormant men and stimulate them to be active as males, comparable to male dogs, hence the name Lobart This name ties in perfectly with the roots of plants and plants that contain aphrodisiacs, examples of which include Kraman Pot. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, my, my, my National service assistant is sick. He's a botanist. And I asked him to look for the real scientific name of this. And he's in the hospital. Um, I also asked uh, uh, Anchor to go to botany department. And the, he was there yesterday. They can't tell what it is. So of course, it's work in progress. So those of you who know what Kraman Pati is, you can <laughs> let us have it to make the presentation complete. Now, uh, it is interesting to note that uh, herbalists that are located in Kwame Nkrumah Circle and Medina Zongo Junction 
were those who actually brought our samples of this garment party and then uh, Datura and showed to me. The views of those informants regarding the use of Kraman party and then Datura is very interesting. They actually gave a historical account of the sudden rise of the use of these two for purposes of sex. Now, what is of interest is the extent to which I would like to locate the sudden rise in terms of sex and prostitution as a result of some of the economic challenges that we have gone through as a country. The devastating effects of neoliberal reforms in post-colonial Ghana, especially from the 1980s, have had profound impact on Ghana. The government's implementation of structural adjustment program enforced by the IMF since the 1980s have led to deepening urban and rural poverty and high unemployment rates among the youth, especially those in the city. The increase in young men and, and women who engage in transactional sex could be partly due to this. But there's a way that we need to reach the issue of cost being incurred in sex and how that will lead to the patronage of Aphrodisians. Many of the young men I interviewed indicate that if they are paying for sex, then they must really enjoy it. Uh, enjoy it. Enjoyment here has nothing to do with real excitement, rather than how long it will last. This concept of lasting has even been popularized by musicians. Till Keteka, and those of you who know VIP and the rest, will we'll elaborate more on that. Some young men did not hide their, feel, their feelings to get more out of what they have paid for, by including that quote, Niyites and Sanamashi of <laughs> There has also been a shift in the nature sex is conducted. Initially, some young girls left their poorer same age boyfriends to look for richer and more well established men who can provide their immediate and in some cases their family needs. This is there's a tendency to keep their young boyfriend and in some cases even support them financially through a trade or education. One way to make up for the financial disempowerment was through sexual empowerment, which in some cases will call for the use of drugs. Also, the rich and well-to-do are very much aware of the presence of the young guys are, and are even more aware of their inability to sometimes match their performance. The effect then is to acquire sex-enhancing drugs. A casual visit to some of the drinking spots and pharmacy shops indicates the presence of some herbal-based aphrodisiacs, which, in, which informants indicate is patronized by both the young and then the older men. Still on the issue of health for sex, I shall indicate that the patronage is also due to an increase in the number of hawkers and peddlers of herbal medicine who are taken to the street and market centers instead of staying in the comfort of their homes to be visited by clients. As stated, Charles and Enina, in his article, Traditional Medis Medical Practice in Contemporary Ghana, highlights the failure of medical practice in the 1990s and 1980s and 1990s, and points to the diversion of attention from Ghanaians, from the hospital and doctors, to the herbalists and peddlers. For him, the patronage of herbal drugs, which include aphrodisiacs, was due to the striker and German reforms, which made many unemployed people to go into the sale of herbal medicine. The import here is about the sudden rise in the use of Datura as an aphrodisiac, which, as we have observed, is not entirely new in the history of most societies. Before concluding the lecture with the negative effects of the use of Datura, let's have a, a look at a four-minute video on, on the effect. This is uh, on the web, and it's, it's from the United States, but it's, it's, it's relevant to our discussion.
Experts say growth of the plant is widespread in virtually every state in the country, making it terrifyingly easy for teens to get their hands on it. Much to the chagrin of cops and poison experts who know of Jimson's dangers. The fourth most feared botanical on this planet, therefore, in my opinion, there's not much anything more dangerous than this plant. What can this do to you? It can kill you. You can die easily. That's something Lantina Martinez of El Paso, Texas knows all too well. Last summer, her 17-year-old son Goliath died after consuming a cocktail brewed from gypsum weed. It was part of my heart. Through broken English, she tells us the death of her son has left her literally shattered. My life is like rocket. Broken. Yes, it's broken inside to me. But even surviving the deadly hallucinogenic effects of ginseng weed can be a living nightmare. I seen a pile of dead bodies and they started coming to life for me. And I seen just spiders on the wall, ants were crawling around. 17-year-old Gene Spreeze of Chula Vista, California knows all about ginseng hallucinations. After drinking a large dose of ginseng brewed tea with a friend, the two got so high, they were brought into the local police station for observation. If you ever wanted to know exactly what ginseng weed can do to you, pay very close attention to what you're about to see. It's a tape Chula Vista police made of James and his friend under the influence of ginseng weed. The two are so impaired they can't even speak. Again, what you're about to see is no act. James is the one on the right. And James goes in. James and his friend are truly in a world known only to them. You may see them pass a cigarette to each other, only there is no cigarette. James' friend later smokes it and actually flicks the ashes. Again, there is nothing in his hand. James styles his hair with an imaginary comb. He beckons to friends in the room that only he can see. There is fear in the eyes of both boys and major anxiety. Motor coordination skills are almost completely gone. We watched this tape with James Freeze at his home. He'd never seen it before. Okay, buddy. This scary. I don't remember anything about this. I don't remember anything. James Freeze, you should know, is a former habitual drug user who's been in rehab. He's tried everything from pop to crack. How does this Jensen weed stack up? Well, it's crazy. I mean, from my experiences, it's the most stupidest things I've ever done in my life. Not every kid, of course, will OD on ginseng weed the way James did. But because ginseng weed is a poison and its level of toxicity varies from plant to plant, one can never be sure. So playing around with it is dangerous. Yes, you might get away with it, but there's an excellent chance that you or one of your friends could have very serious poisoning or might even die. A lesson one grief-stricken mother urges teenagers to heed to avoid the mistake her son made, to avoid the ginseng plant. The plant is very bad. Very, very bad. And James and his friend agreed to make that tape public because they want to warn other teens about the dangers of ginseng. And still ahead of it, it would be... Also known as angels. Thank you. Thank you for the video. Uh, fortunately, my, my, uh, our, our assistant is back and he offers a scientific name for Pramankwati uh, as Pian, Pian, Paniantis Zekeri. Maybe you will elaborate more on that. From this uh, video, it, it is very evident that the, the effects of uh, the children could actually be madness. Uh, my ability to track its effect actually 
well from the fact that I grew up in an area and understood this plan. But also, I went to Tamale and contracted a public health nurse to track down the effects of the dual ingestion in the area. And as of 2012, our Philomena Nankani was able to get 97 cases of abuse of natura in Tomale uh, metropolitan area alone, leading to a lot of fatal results. Although um, heavy ingestions may lead to fatal medulla paralysis or cardiovascular collapse, actually most of the deaths are associated with the hallucinogenic effects that normally will let people hurt themselves and then eventually die. In conclusion, I would like to indicate that the social history of the Tura is quite interesting and very fascinating. It's been used for ritual and entertaining uh, purposes. The question then is, as a drug which is yet to be criminalized, should we allow it to be criminalized? Thank you. All right, so at this point, we would like to open the floor for any questions. Um, I personally found this to be quite an interesting discussion, so I'm sure we will get quite a lot of questions. Any comments at all? Thank you for your excellent presentation. I'm Monica Tesla, a visiting Fulbright Scholar from the United States. And I would uh, unequivocally say that it's not a good idea to criminalize drugs based on our experience in the United States where, in my opinion, the war on drugs has really failed and its result has been an unequal policing of blacks in the cities um, and uh, being locked up for marijuana usage, um, whereas marijuana usage, like the usage in some ways of this drug, is pretty widespread, but it's very unequally policed and um, in any case, it's usually not something that is harming other people. People do harm themselves, and I think education and drug treatment are um, the way that has been proven to be much more effective. Thank you very much. Um, I'm so grateful for attending to you. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to congratulate you on this wonderful paper. You have succeeded where I failed. Mm -hmm. Some years ago, I tried to get uh, scientists to be interested in uh, some of the work I was doing, you know, like during the funeral of uh, the Asantehini and all that. I observed that they were carrying some pants full of heads. I also observed the insect, whatever it is that they used to, to ward away evil spirits in the ground. And I thought that would be a fascinating uh, topic for research. So I went to the botany department and got one of the uh, lectures there to research on that. I think what I should have done would have been to look for a younger person, a student who will be interested. And, uh, to go with a historian or somebody in the social science. But I asked her to go. She went alone and she did not understand the cultural um, atmosphere and uh, how the people were answering the questions. A scientific mind, Litmus paper, <laughs> had, had a problem because she was expecting maybe one answer to, to the questions, like in the sciences. So, all this going around and this thing even worse. So we lost we lost the whatever data she got because this was not her well. Mm -hmm. And so it's very good. I want to congratulate you for teaming up and doing it together so that when the scientists as losing hope, you can encourage that in this world, research world, things are different. So continue with the good work and then I'd like to encourage you to look at other areas, like look at those things, chieftaincy. You know, we've done some work on chieftaincy and find out those that are associated with chieftaincy. Especially, we don't know how sometimes a chief can sit in state the whole day 
without going to the washroom. And there's no washroom in this. And the devil, and I keep on wondering the stamina they have to sit in those palm pins and dance on people's head for hours. Come and sit down. They must need. I've always wondered how on earth they, they, they do it, whether there's a supernatural infusion. So I just throw this to you. Okay. He wants to ask yes, can I just say a few words? Uh, um, <clears throat> I noticed that you are concerned about the chiefs not going to the bathroom. But can you imagine those chiefs who have a hundred wives? I'm sure that are two of them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sam, I, uh, my question is quite personal. Did you try it? And if so, what was the effect? <laughs> I'm getting to the age where I appreciate ancestors. <laughs> Thank you. Please, I would like to know if uh, in your research you discovered the use of bacteria among women and what are the effects? Um, I had, uh, first I would like to again thank you for an excellent presentation, very well done, very well thought out, and very well put together. Um, my question is uh, in relationship to one of the things you said about farm workers uh, giving this datura in order to increase production. Um, uh, it brought up a couple of thoughts, especially in light of the video where the guy can barely talk or move. Like, how is that uh, monitored in terms of the level? I read that at a certain level, of course, it's fatal. Um, but at what level is that given? And also, I had a question, um, especially in light of like prison systems in the United States, where drug use is also, is often associated with, you know, imprisonment, even going back to chain gangs, convict labor, that there's always an association of those who are in prison using drugs and sometimes the guards giving them to them either to make sure that they stay calm and don't have rights or things like that. So I was wondering if you could make any type of link between uh, like a, a modern day type of prison system and the drugging of prisoners and what you uh, experienced in terms of farm workers being given this to increase productivity. Productivity is also a major there because you have privatized prisons where all these people are working basically for free in slave labor as provided by the 13th Amendment of the Constitution which says slavery shouldn't exist unless you've been convicted of a crime and usually those are black people. Uh, also with this uh, idea of criminalization which was brought up earlier, do you think if it was criminalized that perhaps northerners or groups who are more associated with it would be uh, adversely targeted whether or not they are actually committing those types of quote unquote crimes. Thank you very much for the comments and then the questions. Uh, first to Prof. Arin, uh, Prof. Monica, thank you for that kind of uh, emphatic uh, response that we don't need to criminalize it and uh, I appreciate that dimension at least if I happen to put in policy issues that will also come and to Prof. Arlene Odette, thank you. In actual fact what you have really said of course I've said it in class also that your ability to sometimes push me hard has led me into trying everything and of course uh, I wanted to actually discuss Datura with respect to warfare in Ashanti. But I didn't dare to go that far because I, I am really, I'm, I'm here to get the evidence. But the pictures that you took during the, um, the performance of uh, the, the late king, uh, you, um, the late king uh, Opokuari, and in the picture book, there were pictures of chiefs, and two of them 
had some plants in their mouth. One of them was the Karen Otunfor, and the other was the Yabi I actually called uh, uh, a few people to clarify, but they said I need to go to Old Yabi myself. And of course, it is known that Old Yabi is very central when it comes to issues of warfare in Asante. So I am here to make a trip to be able to get that and link it to issues of uh, uh, chieftaincy. Uh, the question from uh, the former mayor of Accra, uh, Mr. Nuno Amatafi. Yes, I took the Atura twice. And the first one, I took it when I was in secondary school. And that was when we were trying to democratize the school <laughs> through <laughs> demonstrations. So uh, that was for that purpose. And the second time I took that tour was uh, after I had grown it. You see me trying to plant it in my house. Uh, I was just fascinated with the plant. So I decided to plant it, and you see me harvesting it. Okay. Uh, the second time I took it, I just wanted, I had drafts of this paper. So I wanted to link my body continuation with the mind and be able to speak from evidence rather than from hearsay. Uh, I took about 10 seeds, and I really can describe vividly what happened to me. Uh, I, I was not asleep, and I was also awake. <laughs> yes, but I could see myself uh, trying to cross a kind of river. And then a, a, tree, a tree was cut by who I don't know. But it was cut across the stream, and I walk across the stream back and forth. Okay, it was at that point that, uh, I, that that was what I felt. But fortunately or unfortunately, two tenants in my house have been seeing me watering these plants, taking the measurements, looking at the flowers, taking pictures. And when I was home on the 5th of April to perform my late father's funeral. They took uh, uh, two, uh, they took, I mean, it will go around, and don't pick it, I'll draw samples. The whole thing, this one contains uh, close to about 60 to 70 seeds, and each of them took one one. <laughs> and they were about to die. So I was there when I had a call that this is what has happened. They had stripped themselves naked, and they were urinating on themselves. <laughs> so, it was bad for me, but it's from the point of studies. It was <laughs> so, I quickly told them to pick the seeds and take them to uh, the psychiatric hospital, and they showed the seeds to the doctor. So, they were in the hospital for two days. One of them became an important informant. On a daily basis, he said, oh, so what happened there? It wasn't good. <laughs> I disgraced myself here. So uh, the level that you consume will also influence the purpose for which you are consuming it for. Uh, discovered among women. Uh, is is I cannot actually say because most of my informants, and I think it's been biased, have been heavily that were dotted around Medina and then Kwame Nkrumah second. But once you brought out this dimension, I will investigate that so that I make sure that it is well balanced gender-wise. Because this institute, if you don't do that, <laughs> you risk not getting funds for it. <laughs> okay, the, the issue of um, of farm hands, it goes on to answer your question. Certainly the students uh, took it so that they would be able to work. And it was actually certainly not in, 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 in large quantities. And regarding the criminalization 
of this drug, uh, of this. If they criminalize it, it appears that more men will go into prison than women. Because it is they who always want to prove to the women that they are men. And for those who have been on WhatsApp, I've actually picked up a lot of insights from WhatsApp. There was this case involving a lady in the US and another in Canada. I don't want to mention their names. And it boiled down to the guy in Canada not marrying the lady in the US and marrying a different person, but actually brought the girl to the wedding. And it went back and forth on WhatsApp, and I think PCFM or one of the FM stations it kept playing it, it even was put on YouTube. What the lady said was that, after all, if you have ditched me, I'm not worried because you are not a man. What kind of a man are you? Okotia, I see the tears. You know, your Peniza has, I don't know, maybe you have <laughs> taken a bath. <laughs> and and, and advise the, the, the newly wedded wife that, yes, advise the newly wedded wife that this guy, when I was with him, I was actually having sex with him. He, not, he was not the only having sex with me. And my advice, is for you to go and get medicine for your husband because he's not a man. So it appears that it's men that are more or less interested uh, in it. Uh, of course, my evidence is still based on what I've just uh, uh, been able to discover, but I will also investigate the other dimension. Uh, so in terms of criminalization, this is how far it might go. Uh, is there another? Uh -huh. Yes, I think uh, the, the chair is himself a pharmacist from uh, Kwame Nkrumah University. And I recently returned from the UK. More insights. So. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my first statement was to tell you exactly what happens in your body when you take ginseng weed or tatura. I did tell you that it blocks your some uh, nervous activities. And you saw what happened. Both the ones you control and the ones you cannot control unconsciously. So you realize that they were seeing imaginary things. Because the signals you need to control yourself have been lost. So you are totally oblivious of yourself. You don't know what you are doing. That's why when they asked him later, he said he doesn't remember. So just calm a few nerves. The Jimson weed has good size and it has bad size. Now, the bad size mostly is what we are all scared of. The good size are under control, but the bad size we do not know. So these uh, hallucinations, deliriums, people actually die. Yes, because as the video said, depending on the geography, the chemical components or other components will be different. Uh, I don't know how to put this, but there was a survey which said that Ghana had, excuse me to use the word, the best weed in the whole world because we had the best climate for it. Okay. So depending on the climate, you have uh, the plant picking up certain poisons. One of the prominent ones is atrophy, and yes, it can kill you. I don't want to use uh, too much big science words which uh, do not make any meaning. But for the good side, of course, ginseng weed under control is used for so many things. Example, what you just said for as an aphrodisiac. You, you go to the pharmacy, you see other weed, they call them good weed. It's been registered as a product that you can use, probably, because the amount of uh, chemicals in there are under control. Is it used in asthmatics? Is it used as uh, what we call antihistamine? Okay, it's used for uh, motor activity. Even sometimes some people who have nervous problems or nerve problems use using weed. So it has its advantage or it has its good side. But these good sides are under control. Look at it being grown out in the field openly. So anybody who has access to it might not know the amount to take. Just one seed made somebody lose uh, control. Yes. When it blocks your ability to control urine, what happens? You urinate without knowing that you even I mean, you read on yourself. 
So the danger is the uncontrolled nature of Jensen weed, or is being used without proper understanding. And yes, I do agree with you. Public education on what Jensen weed is is very important. Thank you. Here's my question. And uh, Dr. Tengso, I hope that you'll be doing gender analysis, not just for strategic reasons, but <laughs> for intellectual ones as well. Okay. Um, first question is whether Jensen Wee and Artura, and I guess the, the chair may speak to this more, is it the same plant or is it just because it has the same active ingredients? When you talk about climate, is, does it operate? If you've got the active ingredient, whatever it is, it doesn't operate the same way um, you know, in different uh, cultural conditions. And um, the question that I'm more interested uh, in the answer is how is, um, if Atura used in, in ritual performances and religious practices by you know, traditional priests, by herbalists, and how do they construct it? If they use, if they indeed use it, how do they construct its use? Do they, you know, do they have just a material explanation, or do they have a temporal or a more spiritual explanation? Can I just a, just a small a small question? Yeah. Uh, David, come up from Calvin College uh, in the U.S., um, which is he described the ritual uses as preparing for divination, preparing for communication with the ancestors. Is the, is the substance, the weed, the seeds, the leaves itself used? Is it ever used as an accompaniment to rituals? Is an infusion used as libation? Does, does the plant itself figure in rituals, or is it only that the plant is used in preparation for it? Um, I wanted to find out if you noticed um, its consumption by any um, Animals, like, did you notice animals uh, using it? You know, the animals usually have some sort of uh, knowledge of what they use the plants for. Um, I'd be interested in knowing if you notice any use naturally by the animals. Thank you, Dr. James, for a very enlightening presentation. Uh, just probably something that you can follow up the use of Bunkuma uh, for sports. If you can talk to a few of the old sports masters or old sports guys, at the time that we, we talked, we, this didn't occur to me. Because uh, the old sports masters used to grind Bunkuma seeds mixed with glucose and give to their sportsmen before they get on the field to play. Then another point you could check, probably with uh, cults that initiate people into a new life. Let's take the, the battery of the Dagaba. I'm aware that they use fungi, a uh, millet that has fungus on it. A brew of that makes the initiates to sleep very akin to death. And when they have woken up, they have been reborn into a new life. I'm beginning to wonder, given the widespread nature of Bunkuma, whether Bunkuma is not one of the... Uh, an extract of Bunkuma would not have been fed to some of these initiates. It's worth uh, investigating. But I noticed you sanitize the picture that you put up there on the drama cutting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have uh, a question. We have a pharmacist who is a faculty member here at the University of Ghana and Bengong, but he is actually in China right now. Uh, Paul? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. You can uh, go ahead with your question. Yeah, um, practicing back in Ghana, you would notice that you have these herbal products that are readily available in the pharmacies and even at marketplaces. There is sometimes a deliberate effort by these herbal medicine manufacturers to lace their product with some of these psychedelics. And I would want to know if there's a particular interest to, as it were, screen some of these herbal products and then be able to tell that, yes, these perceptions out there can be confirmed, such that these can inform policy decisions from the EFDA. 
I want to know if something like, did you get that? Yeah. Hello? Yes, yes, we, we got you so far. Did you have anything else? No, no, no. I, I couldn't follow from the beginning, and so I'm unsure in what direction exactly the proceedings went. And so if this would be tackled, I would be very happy to hear what the outcome would be. Also, you'll be happy to know, and I think you already are aware, we uh, put all of the videos up on YouTube, so you'll be able to follow it in full. But with your question, I will let Dr. Antilisu answer that one and the others on the floor. One up. Thank you. One For the questions, um, in my attempt to overemphasize uh, in, in writing, I think I've lost some of the questions. Well, please, if I've forgotten, you just please remind me. Uh, in terms of uh, the writer, please, your question again. I particularly lost your question. I'm, as we the, the, I'm wondering, yes. in, it, in its spiritual yes. and ritual use, yeah. how is it constructed? Mm -hmm. Do you know? Did you ask them? Do they? You know, do they construct it as a hair? Mm. Do they construct it as medicine? Do they construct it in religious terms? Mm. Mm -hmm. I think what happened with this uh, diviner that I spoke to later was that um, he considers, in the first place, he told me how he got into divination. So one day he was in the house and then some voices were calling him in the bush and he left and for three years he was just wandering about in the bush i finally followed to his village where he comes from to ask if that was true uh, they could not say much because he himself was a migrant who came there and so it will mean that any time i'm around the end i might have to go further to uh, Wapuli, where he comes from, to be able to track his record. But what he told me was that after he had left, certain helps were given to him, and not only one. I think you can see him holding some. Those were just, yeah, he was holding some in the left. That one is just for the public purpose. But for the children, he will first grind the leaves. Uh, say tomorrow he's coming to the van in your village. Tonight he will grind the leaves and then take a snuff of it and then smoke some. So whatever dishes he gets and he comes to your village, that is what he's coming to tell you in public. So he consumes it as a spiritual uh, uh, product for purposes of divination. I think that also goes on to, to answer uh, uh, Professor David Hockmas question on how the plant is being used. Uh, actually, it's the leaves that are of essence in this uh, regard. Consumption by animals, that is a very interesting question. Uh, I, I planted datura with other flowers and I realized at one point that all were chewed by animals, uh, goats. And so I decided to replant and fence it. And so in my readings, I came across uh, something which indicates that in the night, the tourist behavior is different than during the day. So I had to stay awake just to be able to know what it was. And for me, I was particularly interested in it as a fragrance. In the night, it has very nice. So I, from time to time, I would go and smell, and it was very good. I encountered goats there, but I think they chose to chew the other flowers because they taste better. Uh, I was, I, I decided to destroy the plants following what happened to the two tenants. I think it would have been good to go back and then see, maybe destroy the other flowers and leave that alone and see which goats come to chew. 
that on two occasions I got angry and had to beat one boot severely. <laughs> almost all the flowers are right. Okay. And then uh, uh, sports, the issue of sports, our investigator, uh, that, that I myself used to be a long distance runner. So I will ask my teacher what he was doing to us. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, there was also one on on courts uh, and, and, and fungi, an issue of uh, initiation. Uh, I think the issue of the bagre and, the, and malt uh, and fungi, I came across it somewhere. Uh, I think it was Goody's work on, on cuisines, but it's something that I will also uh, follow up. Uh, I think so far, any have I left or something? Oh, the, yeah, that one, the question from the video, I think uh, the pharmacist will deal with that. Also, fortunately, I work for the Food and Drugs Authority, so I'll be able to uh, say something about that. Uh, liaison of other products with uh, Datura and uh, you know other aphrodisiac. First and foremost, you are advised to buy medicines from approved facilities. That is pharmacies, licensed chemical shops, and approved herbal shops. So if somebody is carrying them on the head, walking around, definitely that is not an approved uh, place to purchase your medication. If you go to these licenses or approved things, they They, they have these aphrodisiacs, they have what you need, they are there. You go there and tell them your problem. You find a necessary solution. But if you buy for people who roam around, carry it on their hands, market it with lower solutions, then how do we also guarantee that these people don't do what they are supposed to do? So I wouldn't want to delve into that to answer the question why they have liaised it or they have not liaised it. Because they have not been approved in the first place. So, so yes, it is possible that the ladies need to run through these aphrodisiacs and the natural records. Now, then you even have chewing sticks, which are all aphrodisiacs. So, we are advised to buy from approved sources. And this new week will also be there, and these approved sources are controlled levels that will be beneficial to you. But please don't buy from these uh, non resistant people carrying it on their heads. We cannot guarantee that. I hope I answered the question. Oh, there are two ingredients. There are many. But, but uh, uh, yes. Yes, yes it's, it's, uh, it's a jargon. Uh, it's a jargon. 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 You know, help you out. Atrophin. We did not mention that. These are the four we know. Uh, Scopolamin, hyoscinamin, and tropin. Even some of these are even used in more of uh, the, the, the chemical or the orthodox. I don't know how to uh, practice it so that you understand. The chemical that we use. Because the hyoscinamin, for instance, is what we call lusukoma. That we have for especially the ladies who have uh, issues and women have stomach pains and all that, the doctors are that to your medication. So yes, some chemicals in there, you can see that the chemicals that are present keep the necessary effects. And the most important one I mentioned is acrylic, which is uh, the very best. Good morning. Thank you for the lovely presentation, Dr. Um So although Ghana and the United States don't have the same historical trajectory, um, I can't help but wonder what your opinion is um, if, the, if the, the weed is criminalized here in Ghana, then would there be certain groups in Ghana um, criminalized like the United States has criminalized certain marginalized groups in in the United States? Or 
and tag on, sorry, and uh, which certain groups, like, is your opinion, like, would be marginal or would be criminalized if if that did happen? Uh, I think it's a, a very interesting uh -huh. question. Uh, with regards to prison life, I must be very honest. My senior brother, direct senior brother, is a prison officer. I think I will take this question to him, and then I will actually tell him to give me the ethnic dimensions uh, of uh, criminality in this country. But I myself, I will just be honest, I have not taken time to look at which groups are more criminalized as far as our prison system is concerned. Uh, I, I think the statistics is worth looking at. Sometimes if you try to answer it without evidence, you might uh, run into trouble. It's just like the issue of Medina Zongo. Culturally, uh, you see it as a northern enclave. We have a lot of sadness staying there as well, including churches that are up and doing in those areas. So I will, I will actually uh, find out and, and get a response to you. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Good. Actually, the second part of this is that I want to finish the question. Yes. And your experience in relation to the other dimensions. Really? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think that should be the last question. Because that's <laughs> 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 oh, oh, is that the oh, well, Yes. Okay. Yeah, that, that, so, this is the final question. Oh. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. Um, the tour being. <laughs> We, we understand that there's a recreational drug in the, in the sex industry. Mm -hmm. And um, if I, I just wanted the constitution to put the mighty man of this particular if an individual uses it for sexual enhancement and to use a drug for a, a long time, I mean, we use it constantly on, on a daily basis, and the drug becomes normalized to your system, if at the point you are not able to, you do use it, then immediately you know, and you want to believe that you. Or, uh, or the thing that probably you cannot perform, and if it becomes normalized to your system, it will get to a point that even when you take it, you, you suffer with no pain. I mean, I will do something that is not this one. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think uh, just to answer, uh, yes. Oh, yes, okay. okay. Well, I think just, just one quick suggestion. I think, Dr. Tosi, you missed an important research opportunity. Yeah. When the goats were eating your plants, Really? Yeah. Only you had choose some leaves, you could have interviewed the goats. <laughs> 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 Purposes, um, and I think now that you have mentioned it, I, I might <laughs> consider I took it just to be able to feel the way I just feel and to be able to write better. Uh, with the issue of getting to an optimum level and finally deciding, I think you will be the last and then the, I think we are. Uh, Yes, I think you, you, you generally answered the question. Um, when you take medication to a certain level, tolerance will develop and you know the implications. Your body might not respond to it, and then you begin to have the effects of the abuse of it, which will be total collapse. So yes, it will have an effect on you. I think we'll come to the end of the seminar. So. Okay, so we would like to thank everyone. Uh, give yourselves a hand for coming out. This is probably one of the largest groups we've had so far. And as promised, we have some free dot for everyone to sample. Um, and also, finally, the seminar for education perspective, we found out that. Um, Mr. Mwani for every man who came except Dr. Ntelusu because he knew he was researching Datura. He said this man will definitely be good for my sister. So 
We would like to again thank everyone for coming. We'll be back here next week um, at the same time, Thursday at 9 a.m. So we look forward to seeing you. The video should be up within the week. And again, thank everyone for coming and thank Dr. Joe Sue and Mr. Wani for a wonderful presentation today. Another round of applause.